Uh, my background's in addiction medicine, and back in the mid to late 1990, 1990s, and some of you are old enough to remember this, we, the internet, something called the internet was starting up, and that's back when you had to dial up to use it. I don't know if any of you remember that. You would push a button and it would screech and squeal and it make this horrible noise. You sound, you know, it sounded like you were having an epileptic fit. <laughs> and you'd be connected to the internet and then, you know, the screen would slowly scroll up. And then I remember being in my basement. It's always in the basement. And I was hooked up to the internet and I was staring at this screen for hours. And this is back in probably 97 you know, 96, 97. I, store, I stared at that screen and I'm looking, why am I looking at it? There was nothing on the internet then. Even porn hadn't quite made it there yet. <laughs> and we know that's, you know, we know that story. <clears throat> but I, I found myself dissociating or experiencing time distortion. How many people in this room, when they go online, and now of course you can go online with a variety of devices, including the popular portal, the smartphone, how many people lose track of time? Yeah, so that's a universal phenomena, and what that means is that the internet modality itself, regardless of the portal that you use, whether it's a smartphone, a tablet, an iPad, or a laptop, or a computer, it doesn't matter what it is, you're gonna lose track of time and space. And that means that the internet modality is psychoactive, meaning that it changes mood and consciousness. In other words, it's a digital drug. And right now we have a 90 plus percent penetration of smartphone use in the United States. So that means within 10 years, we, 90% of you, and it's actually growing, it'll probably be close to 100% in the next couple of years, have a smartphone. And this is across all ages, all demographic groups. The fastest growing demographic is 60, 65 and up. So, when my father, who's 85, got a smartphone, I knew something was changing. <laughs> the internet's the world's largest slot machine. Why is that? Because it operates on a variable ratio schedule of reinforcement. So a variable ratio reinforcement schedule is that every once in a while, when you go online, I don't care what device you use, you don't know what you're going to find, when you're going to find it, how good it's going to be, whether it's going to be something you want or don't want, you don't know the timing of it, and you don't know how often it's going to happen. So all those things are unknown. That could be looking something up on Google, checking a sports score, a stock score, an email, a text. It doesn't matter what the content is. It could be looking at porn because uh, there's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of images. It could be anything because it's variable when you're going to get it, how good it's going to be, and what it's going to be. That's the way a slot machine operates. It just so happens that that schedule of reinforcement is the most resistant to extinction, which is another way of saying it's addictive. Because the brain will keep pushing that button, or that mouse, over and over and over again because of the anticipation of a reward. Now, here's the interesting part. That reward elevates dopamine in your brain. Dopamine is a neurochemical that is associated with pleasure. It's not a, everybody has it. You probably wouldn't want to eat without it. It's associated with sex. It's the same neurochemical that's elevated when you do drugs. It's the same neurochemical that's elevated when most pleasurable activities are engaged in. We have this thing now, and this is true for not just Generation D, or the youth generation, which you guys see a lot on campus. But we have something called broadcast intoxication, and I have slides that will cover it. But, you know, sometimes I end up talking about everything on my slides without showing you the slides, which is fine. So what's broadcast intoxication? So everybody, the 90 plus percent of people that have smartphones, walk around with their smartphone, and they take pictures of everything. What they eat, you know, what they saw, you know, if they stepped in, you know, some dog doo-doo, they take a picture of that, you know, whatever it is, and then they post it. And then they wait to see who looked at it. And then they wait to see if who looked at it liked it, or acknowledged it, or rated it, or ranked it, or whatever, or retweeted it, or redid this, or redid that. So 
What we are seeing now is a generation that has what I call reflected self-esteem. Their self-esteem is not based on their direct experience or they're not even experiencing it. What they're doing is experiencing the opportunity to photograph, record, and post their lives with the hope that somebody will acknowledge what they're doing so that they can decide whether what they were doing was really okay or not, or really important, or really fun. And that's pretty sad. But this, this is endemic right now. And it's not just in the youth culture. This is endemic to adults as well. In other words, if they didn't record it, it didn't happen. There is a lot of research now that the social context of addiction is important. But what we hear about technology is that technology connects people socially. But actually what the data is showing and what we are all experiencing physiologically and neurologically is that it actually cuts us off from connection. Even social media doesn't make us feel more connected. We feel, when you look at people's feelings of social connection and intimacy, after they use social media, they're actually lower. They don't feel more connected, they feel more isolated. And that was, that's one of the things that makes us potentially more addicted. But you remember I talked about the slot machine, the internet's world big, big, world's biggest slot machine? So, and I said we're carrying around portable dopamine pumps. There's something we know about addiction that's very important that applies to technology. The shorter the latency, the shorter the amount of speed between you going online and checking something, pushing the button, clicking, and then what you get, in other words, the response, what you're finding, you know, the text that you check or the email or whatever it is, the shorter that speed, the more addictive that is. And we know that because that's what we know that about drugs because crack cocaine is more addictive than regular cocaine and why IV heroin use is more dangerous than snorting it or smoking it. So why is this relevant to technology? Because guess what's happening to technology? Anyone know? It's getting faster. Processes are faster. We're trying to make networks faster. We're untethering everything. We're making it so literally you have instantaneous feedback. You combine that with the slot machine changes in the brain and what you have is a powerful drug. Adolescents from about 15, 14, all the way up to early 20s, they have an interesting phenomenon, and this is why it's relevant to you as uh, education professionals. Their limbic system, the reward circuitry I just showed you, that nucleus accumbens, is actually at its peak of development. In other words, they're very driven by pleasure. I don't think this comes as a surprise to you. Um, it, but at the same time, they have the least development of the prefrontal cortex. So they're mostly limbic system, primitive dinosaur type brain and not a lot of human brain. That's why I call them dinosaurs. So they have a lot of drive to do pleasurable fun things and not a lot of judgment to think about the consequences. This is why we see kids drink themselves to death, unfortunately. I had a patient the other day, and I know there have been, inc there have been horrible incidents at UConn. In fact, the, one of the students was from West Hartford, where I live. Um, and there was another case, I have a patient whose brother, freshman year, first few weeks of school, drank too much, which is all too common, and fell, hit his head, had a closed head injury and died. You know, six weeks into the school year. That's the cause of, from having inadequate prefrontal development and a high degree for pleasure seeking as well as peer responsiveness. So like many things that are addictive or that we feel dependent on, when we let go of them, we actually have an improvement. I'm not suggesting you all throw your phones out. What I am suggesting is limitations, and I want to cover that real quickly. Set limits for use. Remember we just, so this is for yourself, for your children, for your students, doesn't matter. I'm applying these in general. You know, allow, figure out how much time you're spending on them. There's apps on your phone already that come with your phone that'll tell you how much time you're spending on it. So you'd be shocked to know how much time you're using your phone or your computer. Figure it out so you know, so you get feedback. Because if we don't have feedback, we're going to distort that amount of time. Put apps or things that block your usage when you're on your, when you're um, at times that you don't want to use your phone, particularly when you're in your car. If your phone's in your car and you have notifications on, you're going to pick it up. 
You're six to seven times more likely to have an accident if you're touching your phone when you're in your car.